thank you so much. Um, everyone, I'm so pleased and grateful to have Dr. Susan Nianzi here with us today. Uh, she earned her Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry and a minor in Psychobiology, as well as a Master's and a Doctorate in Public Health from Loma Linda University. Um, as you can see these letters behind her name, she is a Master Certified Health Educator Specialist. She's a member of the American College of Sports Medicine. She's also a Fellow of the Royal Society of Public Health. She is a chronic disease management specialist. Um, she provides integrated lifestyle counseling in nutrition, physical activity, stress and addictive behaviors, um, focused on preventing and managing chronic uh, degenerative disorders and illness. So really she has this integrative approach. Um, so she counsels and she provides experience and wisdom to provide individualized lifestyle modification programs. She's done this with diabetes. She's worked with veterans. Um, she has worked in a rheumatology clinic. Um, she has a current practice. She's at City of Hope. So working with those um, who are going through cancer. She uh, is published. She has spoken nationally and internationally. And we're just so excited to have her here with us. Dr. Nianzi, thank you for being here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, and again, thank you for the great welcome. Just a quick, um, uh, I guess, expansion on the definition of Master Certified Health Educator Specialist. So that means we know how to help people change behaviors in a gradual way, um, and then to help them sustain that behavior as well. And then the Fellow of the Royal Society of Public Health, it's really the British version of Master Certified Health Educator Specialist. And as you can tell, there is a little bit of a British accent because I grew up in England. Okay, so now we'll get going. So uh, we're first gonna look at nutrition and I'm kind of focusing on breast cancer as well. And then we'll also talk about how uh, physical activity is also important. Now we would have thought that uh, nutrition and physical activity before, during and after treatment would, would have been looked at or uh, focused on a long time ago. It's actually been since 1979 that one of the founders started talking about this. And so the whole thing is about nutritional care during the various stages of cancer treatment, how we can prevent and reduce complications associated with the treatment, of course, the side effects and what that can do to the body. And then uh, uh, looking at cancer and cancer treatment itself, how that can change the body and also how, can, how that can help us tolerate foods and also how we can best utilize nutrients. So if I know this was back in 1979, th these principles still apply today. So I kind of put some pictures here to kind of uh, show what we'll be talking about in a nutshell. So the goal for nutritional care is really to prevent or reverse nutrient deficiencies. So we've got some major vitamins, minerals, and uh, immune cells that we want to maintain. And so patients on therapeutic doses, nutrients seem to live longer and there's, um, you can cut down on the tumor recurrence what is she? by half. We don't see here, these are her. Hello? Oh, you don't see the slides? No, you're, you're good to go. I think, um, can everyone see the slides? Okay, thanks Kelly for that thumbs up. You're good to go. Oh, okay. And then the other part of uh, nutritional care is also to prevent loss of lean body mass. So most breast cancer patients usually gain body fat and lose lean body weight. And so these are the references from where this information is coming from. And then also the other goal of nutritional care is to tolerate treatments better. Uh, so properly nourished patients have uh, less nausea, less hair loss, because they're stocked up on the nutrients. 
Okay. Um, the other one is to reduce nutrition related side effects. So the side effects are gonna, you know, cut down on the minerals, vitamins, and all these antioxidants that we have. So you wanna build up your reserves. And it also helps maintain strength and energy. So you wanna eat your balanced meals. So you have to make sure you have your carbohydrates, your proteins, fats, and of course, vitamins and minerals. Also nutritional care, what it also does is to protect, protect immune function and lower the risk of infection. So as you go through treatment or also before you go to treatment when you have cancer, um, the cancer or other chronic conditions as well, they can reduce your risk of, uh, they can make your immune function not work the way it should. And if your immune function is down, it's going to increase your risk of infection. And so even though skin acts as a barrier and we have the antibodies functioning as well, but the vitamins and minerals also play a role in that as well. So I've got a, a reference from a peer review article where this came from. It also helps, proper nutrition also helps immune cell activity and make sure that that is protected. And so you want, again, your vitamins, I've listed them here, your minerals, uh, iron, zinc, copper, and selenium. So selenium is a super um, antioxidant. So we need that iron, zinc, and copper also play a role. And again, I've got a reference here where all this information came from. So putting all of this together, Helps in it helps you recover during your treatment and also maximizes healing and also maximizes quality of life. Okay, then, oh, I put a picture here because we're gonna be talking about some, some good stuff, but I want you all to be nice and calm and kind of look at how soothing the colors are, okay. We'll move on. So before treatment, why is, um, okay, I'll, we'll do the survey. So is nutrition before uh, treatment important or not important? Uh, yes, it's important because you're preparing the body and you're stocking up on all of the things we talked about so that you can handle the next stage pretty well. So why is that important? So you want to prevent or reverse nutrient deficiencies. You want to preserve your lean body mass. Remember we talked about that uh, some of the patients when they're going through treatment, they gain body fat. That's a no-no. We want to reduce that and we want to preserve our lean body mass because that's going to help us during the recovery. And then you're going to tolerate the treatment better as well. And if you have all your nutrients um, stocked up, you'll get, you'll have uh, lower nutrition related side effects. So the, the cancer itself or the treatment is going to cause some side effects which are going to impact your nutrients. But if you're stocked up, that will help. And it's also going to help you maintain your strength and energy and also protect your immune function and reduce your risk of infection and help in recovery and healing. And of course, maximize quality of life. You want to maximize that. OK, another question. And I think we all know this one. Uh, which one is better, fresh food, fresh foods or fast foods? Fresh foods. And I've actually got some links here that tell you what is in the fast foods. Um, I don't know whether we can click on it, but maybe we'll try later on. But fast food is not what it seems to be. There's a whole bunch of other stuff they add in there to enhance the taste, to make it look good. 
and of course for it to have a longer shelf life. Uh, okay, so yeah, and I've also got another list um, that talks about the additives. Additives are pretty harmful as well. So now let's look at the different types of places where we can get our foods. So uh, supermarket fruits, is that gonna be a good option compared to farmer's markets? Farmer's markets are gonna be best. Supermarket foods, and I actually have read this several times, and if you were in our Savoring uh, Hope cooking class, you would remember in one of the sessions, I talked about how the supermarkets, what they do, they use radiation to get the color of the fruit to make it look ripe. But when you bite into it, it has no taste, it's not sweet. Because they picked the fruit really early before it ripened naturally, so all the natural juices and all of that are not there because they forced it to ripen by just changing the color. So sometimes you'll find that supermarket fruits, however nice they look, they really don't taste that good. That will also happen to fruits as well, like tomatoes. Uh, what about deli meats? Well, I think back in the day when they first started deli meats, it was really just pure deli meat. But now it's so processed and it has so many additives in there that even for uh, a healthy person, this would not be a good option. Uh, for those with chronic conditions or maybe with cancer, this might sound good, but technically it won't be really good for your system because it's so processed. And then also the additives that are added in there. Another one, which seems really nice and easy, pre-cooked supermarket foods. Um, they used to have those big rotisserie chickens. Look at the ingredients. It's not rotisserie chicken, salt and pepper. There's a big paragraph to tell you what is in there. So those ones are also a no-no. And it's actually better when you make it at home. Okay. Now let's focus on um, the nutrients during treatment. So again, we talked about we want to maintain nutritional status and we want to eat our balanced meals. And I've got some examples of, um, let me see whether I can move this so I can. Yeah, so I've put some examples of what would be some good things to eat uh, while you're going through treatment. So fruit smoothies are good and they have what they call elemental drinks. Elemental drinks are, um, I know people might go to boost or subdue. No, 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 no. Those are bad. Those are packed with sugar and, and a whole bunch of other stuff that shouldn't be in there. But there are some that uh, really have all the nutrients you need. And what they've done, they've broken it down to the molecular level so that when you drink it, it can start absorbing. It doesn't have to wait in the stomach to get absorbed. So that's what they call elemental drinks. Back in the day, you needed a prescription for it. But I think now they, um, a lot of the dietitians or maybe some of the docs may know which are good examples of elemental drinks. And by the way, again, from Savoring Hope, we also talked about Fruit, soup, uh, fruit smoothies that can replace meals. And Chef Christian had some great recipes on how to make them balanced so that it can replace a meal. So now let's look at the food itself. So we need some protein in our meals. And of course, plant-based protein is gonna be the best option. Um, another place you can get protein Beans, nuts, nut milk, uh, all of these examples are good sources of plant protein. And this is what the body can utilize the best. And then you want your carbs. And so that would be the rice and the pasta. And by the way, they do have gluten-free options. 
So with the pasta, the gluten-free options, again, look at the label. You don't want anything that is that has three or more, that has more than three ingredients in there. And of course, your fruits and vegetables, and you also want your good fats. So I've put the nut milk, um, the nut butters, all of that is, is good. Now, I put the acronym SMASH to help us remember what type of fish that uh, we can take in, or people with cancer who are going through treatment, if you can still tolerate fish, these are the top fish that are going to have the highest amount of omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids are our friends. Uh, for those with chronic condition, cancer is considered one of them. And also going through treatment, these are going to be our best buddies. So S stands for salmon, M for mackerel, A for anchovies, S for sardines, and H for halibut. So these will be the top fish that have omega-3 fatty acids. How will you know that you're eating the right amount of omega-3, I mean of fish, to get the omega-3 fatty acids that the body needs? So that will be two servings per week. Spread it out, um, and, and that will be a good option. Another thing to include is a multivite and also Q enzyme 10. So again, this is coming from a resource. It said that most cancer patients required more than the recommended daily allowance. So there is a difference between the recommended daily allowance versus the therapeutic amount as well. But I think even regular people don't have the right amount of the multivite or the Q enzyme 10. At least if you can get up to the recommended daily allowance, that would be great. And also make sure that the supplements you're, you're getting are from a reputable source because they're all not the same. They might say they have this, this amount of this vitamin, this amount of, of um, mineral, but read the label and check and see where all of that is coming from. And also make sure that they're as natural as possible. There's no preservatives, no additives, and no fillers. So the fillers, and the, the drug company does this, they put in fillers in uh, tablets, all tablets, all capsules. And these are usually gluten, lactose, corn, all of these are the compounds that shouldn't be in medication, but they can cause intolerances for people. So for me, I have an intolerance to gluten, lactose, and corn. But if you read your ingredients list for all of your medications, you're gonna find it in there. And by the way, one scientist, why they added lactose in there and it shouldn't be in medicine is because one scientist said, well, you know, that's a good way of getting the medicine into the cell. Not taking into account people who are intolerant to lactose, but that's what they do. Anyway, I gave a suggestion of uh, a vitamin that is natural, with no preservatives, no additives, and no fillers. Okay, now let's look at, at some of the uh, meals that we can put together during treatment when you have no appetite whatsoever and what strategies someone can use to kind of help with getting some nutrients in. It's usually easier to plan ahead and, and, and plan menus ahead of time. If you can, um, pick a day, Saturday or a Sunday, and plan your menu for the week ahead. It's fun if you have someone to help you prepare the meals, friend, family members, you know, you all come up with, 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 with a, a menu plan, you all meet up in a kitchen, someone's kitchen, and you have a, an assembly line 
and you do the meals that way. Now, the other option, well, not other option, another good suggestion, fresh foods are more appealing than processed foods. And with fresh foods, you know exactly what you're having there. Processed foods, you have to read the ingredients to make sure it has the right amount of what you're looking for and to make sure it has your fiber, your, your protein, your carbohydrate, all of that stuff. So trying to get an In-N-Out burger, I used to love those, um, is not going to help you in the long run. Because remember, we want to up up and stock up on your uh, minerals, vitamins, fiber, all of these things, and you're going to get it from the fresh foods. And again, if you don't have an appetite, it usually gets worse during the end of the day. Try and eat most of your calories in the morning. I'm not saying sit down and, and chow down all of the food. No. With this one, grazing is going to be the best option. So we're going to eat small meals more frequently, but those meals are going to be packed with, with, uh, with nutrients and are going to have energy, and that will help sustain you uh, during, during the day. And hopefully, you're not going to be losing a whole bunch of weight because you've got some nutrients in. And again, make eating enjoyable. Um, have a, you know some friends over, eat together. Uh, if not, you know, put on your the 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 TV that you, the program that you like the best, and and watch that while you're eating. So in a way, you're kind of distracting yourself, uh, but you're getting that food in at the same time. So here's an example of a meal plan that you can have during um, when you're going through uh, treatment. So I've got a bowl of mixed salad fruits and I've tried to make it interesting. Cantaloupe, everybody eats cantaloupe. But you know, throw in some mangoes and strawberries or some pineapple and then follow that up with a, a vegetable omelet. Again, you can share that with a friend or you know, cut half of it. That will be for lunch or dinner maybe. And then have some tea and some juice after that. And then morning snack, I've kind of given some examples here of what that could be. And for lunch, I've given an example there as well. And for afternoon snack, I've also put something there and also for dinner as well. So as you can see, it has your fruits and vegetables, a variety of them, and they're all different and they're all spread out so that you're getting as much of your nutrients as you can um, throughout the day. Okay, now we'll talk about altered taste. If you have an altered taste, you're not going to want to eat, but we need to get those nutrients in. So what would be, um, what are some things we can do to help alleviate that so we can still get something in? So seasoning with tart flavors, that usually helps. And then flavoring your food with herbs, that also helps. And then serving the, the food at room temperature, that usually lessens the food taste and smell. And then also using plastic utensils instead of the regular metallic one. If you have that metallic taste, that's not going to feel good. Whereas with the plastic utensils, um, that is going to help somewhat. And then we also want to drink lots of fluids throughout the day. And also, rinse the mouth before eating. That will help with the altered taste as well. Okay. Uh, next slide. So here's a menu for someone who has an altered taste, kind of including all of those things we, we just talked about. So I put it all 
into a menu that someone can use. Uh, so I've got it there for the breakfast, for the morning snack. I've got it, I've put it in for the lunch. I've done it for the afternoon snack. And then I've also put it in there for the dinner as well. Okay. Okay, so actually, before we go on to the slide, do we have any questions? Oh, we're good. Yes, a couple have qu of questions have popped up. Um, you had mentioned kind of, someone was wondering if you were going to go over the, what the therapeutic doses for each of the vitamins and minerals that you've mentioned were, and if not, where could those be looked up maybe? Okay, yeah, so I won't go through them on the, on the slide, but you can talk to your nutritionist and your doctor as well. Let's talk, let's say registered dietitian and then also your doctor as well. Um, that, that will make them understand or see that you know what you're talking about when you start talking about therapeutic doses. And then they should be able to find that information for you. And that you can find in peer review articles. Um, yeah, in peer review articles, it, sources such as Medline or Metascape, uh, where they publish these uh, peer review articles. Another one is NIH, National Institute of Health. They have a lot of articles that you can look through. And when you want to make sure that you get the right therapeutic doses, don't just look at one article, look at a couple of articles and see whether they're all coming up with the same number or with the same range. And you want to focus on articles within the last five years since things change regularly. Did that make sense? Yes, thank you. Someone else asked, what about acai bowls? Which one, sorry? Someone asked, what about acai bowl? Is that something that you recommend? Um, I haven't heard of that. Am I pronouncing? I, I know everyone says acai different. Acai, acai, it's spelled A-C-A-I. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, I've seen it. I haven't done an in-depth uh, okay. lit review on it to give a, a good response. Oh, is that <laughs> Crystal's, Crystal's holding one up. <laughs> They're very ah. popular. <laughs> It's the, they're a beautiful color. They're very, um, people love taking pictures of their acai bowls. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, and then someone else asked, which elemental drink do you recommend? Uh, they actually have changed. Um, they change on a regular basis. But the one that um, I used to prefer, they called it, um, uh, of course, it's gone out of my head. It's not ensure and it's not boost. Um, uh, as of course, it's gone out of my head. But when you look at the ingredients, it should just have, it shouldn't have added sugar. It shouldn't have dairy in it. It shouldn't have corn and it shouldn't have wheat, but it should have, uh, uh, the names, the names of the carbohydrates that are in there. Uh, is, that, is that making sense? Someone's asking, really is it know. Kate Farms? Yeah, I've heard of Kate Farms, but it does have some of those uh, compounds that cause intolerances. Oh, okay. So that's not the one. Yeah. You're so not many people can take that. And then it's not really at the molecular level. It, it breaks it down to two molecules, but not into one molecule. With two molecules, you can still get, if you have an intolerance, you can still react to them. Okay, if it comes to mind, let us know. Yeah, and, we'll put it in the chat. and there's another one um, that starts with the V. I forget the name of it, but that one, you don't need a prescription for that anymore. Uh, and you can buy it directly from the pharmaceutical company. 
two more questions. Um, okay. One person asks, what is the best diet to fight breast cancer? For example, vegan, high protein, pescatarian. So actually vegan would be best because from right in the beginning, I talked about plant protein. So we want to stock up on the plant protein because um, that will be best with uh, managing uh, some of the hormonal molecules in there, like the estrogen. So the plant protein will help uh, with that. And so actually going vegan is going to be um, the best option for uh, someone going through breast cancer. Thank you. And the last question for now is, what is the purpose of coenzyme 10? So coenzyme 10 is um, a molecule that helps give us energy. They also give it for um, patients who are on statins. Statins are a way of trying to get rid of the bad cholesterol. Well, that kind of harms the muscle fibers as well. And it also kind of uh, harms the um, energy pathway that the, the cells, that each individual cell uses. Q10 amps up that energy within the cell so that it improves on us feeling better, having more energy, um, and, and not feeling so lethargic or having so much brain fog. So it kind of clears that up. But the main focus is creating more energy in the energy pathway of every single cell in the body so you don't feel so tired. Did that make sense? Yes. Is there a difference between coenzyme 10 and coenzyme Q10? I think they're the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Well, they, they function, their function is the same. Okay. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll let you proceed. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'll go a bit faster because we've got quite a few slides. So um, what if during treatment you have dry mouth? Well, we need to try and get in as much fluid as we can. Uh, from a public health perspective, you usually tell people to, to drink eight to 12 cups of fluid or of water. So that's why it's a good thing to take a bottle of water with you wherever you go. So you can take a sip on that regularly. Another suggestion is eating soft, moist foods. Again, fruit smoothies are a good one. And then also soft cooked protein. If you're gonna get some protein in there, you can do some soft cooked chicken or maybe some fish. A good option is like chicken noodle soup. That would be uh, pretty good. Another one is um, kind of moist, foods or how you can moisten your foods. So that will be with broths or with creamed soups. So these will be soups that, soups that you will cook, finish cooking them, and then you'll put them uh, in a blender so it comes out creamy. And then of course, adding sauces and margarine or butter uh, to the food so that they don't feel so dry. And then also suck on frozen fruit such as grapes, strawberries, uh, sour lemon, or even ice chips. And also you want to avoid mouthwashes. They have alcohol in them and that's gonna dry out your mouth even more. Well, what if you have sores in your mouth during treatment? So of course you want to avoid the acidic foods, the citric juices and the vinegar and Go for lukewarm, creamy, soothing foods, mashed potatoes, pastas, that kind of a thing. And then also season with herbs, basil, oregano, and thyme. And also uh, you wanna focus on um, 
moist, soft foods. Again, this is where fruit smoothies come in. Remember not to put the citric fruits in there. And uh, of course, the supplemental drinks as well. And also fish is a good option. Okay, so what about if you have nausea, uh, but you still need to get those nutrients in? So you want your small meals, six to eight meals throughout the day. You want your dry foods, crackers, toast, dry cereal, and also sip on liquids frequently. Um, if I know you have, I mean, nausea, uh, you want to prevent dehydration as well. So keep drinking throughout the day. So sip up, uh, no, sit on, sit up, well, I guess after eating, sit up for two hours to kind of give time for the food to go down. And um, bland foods are better tolerated than spicy foods. And of course, suck on the hard candy or the fruit candy as well. So um, dehydration can also be a problem because of diarrhea. And so with diarrhea, you can have your Pedialyte or your um, Rehydrate. So you can make your own Pedialyte at home. Uh, WHO has recipe, recipes on how you can make your own Pedialyte at home. And I would rather do that than do the Pedialyte because they've added sugar to it now and it's sugar from corn. So if you have intolerances to that, you're gonna to totally react to that. Whereas when you make your own, you control the amount of sugar that is uh, going in there. The other thing you wanna to do to kind of help with recovering from diarrhea is to eat foods that are high in potassium. So this will be your fruit juices, your potatoes and banana. You also want to eat foods that are high in sodium. I mean, not high, high in sodium or adding a whole bunch of salt to your foods. No, 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 no. You can do the broths, the crackers, or baked chips. And then you want foods that have pectin. Pectin is a type of fiber. So that's going to be your bananas and your applesauce. Now, pectin is good at lining the gut lining. And that is good when you have diarrhea because when you have diarrhea, everything is just washed out. The lining of the gut kind of gets damaged a bit. So by eating the pectin, you're kind of helping that to soothe it up and to feel better and to kind of help it heal. So we talked about small frequent meals, and also sipping on fluids uh, throughout the day. So what about you have constipation? So with constipation, we also need to drink our fluids. And he, in here, I've also put prune juice. Uh, prune juice is actually a good way of getting things moving. And of course, there are different teas you can take as well that can help with that. And you also want to increase your fruit intake and your vegetable intake as well, including whole grains. So whole grain breads and beans. The, um, the vegetables and the whole grains, they're gonna act like a sweeper in the intestine and they're gonna help push things along. Uh, and that's also gonna reduce your risk of colon cancer as well. Movement is another way to kind of help uh, with the constipation. The movement, what it's doing is kind of helping with the peristalsis go along. So walking, try and walk a mile around the block or doing yoga stretches. Those ones are also gonna help big time. And then also to make the, um, the bowel movement at a regular time. So your body gets used to that. Okay. Now, we've talked about the nutrition during treatment. Now, let's talk about the uh, physical activity during treatment as well. So one of the big problems during treatment is fatigue. And one of the articles I saw, it said that 60% of the patients had substantial fatigue and 30% couldn't do 
daily activities. And so the side effects greatly affect functional level. And so people might end up with anemia, muscle weakness, heart muscle damage. And, and so things just kind of end up going into a cycle. The old recommendation used to say, no, 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 avoid exertion whatsoever. Just lay in bed. No, wrong, 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 wrong. We have to keep moving. We have to keep doing some form of physical activity because that's going to help us in the long run. And we're going to talk about how that works. So on one side, I have the side effects of treatment. And on the other side, I have what physical activity, how physical activity can address that. So everybody feels fatigued. If you keep up with your physical activity, that's gonna keep your energy level up and give you a renewed sense of vitality. Another one of the side effects is heart muscle damage. Physical activity is actually beneficial for the heart as well. It helps it pump well, and it also helps the tissue of the heart as well. One of the other side effects of treatment is losing lean body mass. Physical activity builds lean body mass. So that's going to help big time. Another side effect is muscle weakness. Well, with physical activity, you're strengthening those muscles as well. And then for quality of life is one of the side effects. Physical activity helps improve on that. So what else can uh, physical activity do? Uh, it can boost survival. So this is from a, the nurse's health study. It said people that walked moderately, and to tell you're walking moderately, you're gonna have sweat on the forehead, a little bit of sweat on the forehead. If they did that for an hour, hour and a half daily, that increased survival by 50%. Patients that exercised survived longer. And physical activity also reduces the risk of reoccurrence of cancer. So walking at moderate pace reduced reoccurrence of cancer by 50%. It also combats weight gain and BMI, body mass index. So weight gain during treatment is not a good thing. It's a bad thing long-term. Exercise is gonna help you control that. So the main gist of this, of this slide is weight gain is gonna increase your BMI. Your BMI, that's gonna increase your reoccurrence and that may decrease your survival. So you don't want weight gain, you want muscle mass gain. Your BMI will not go up and it's gonna reduce your recurrence. Okay, now let's talk about after treatment. Um, let me make sure we have enough time. Okay, so um, during treatment, we talked about how healthy lifestyle, nutrition and physical activity, how that's gonna help you tolerate treatments better, how you're gonna recover quicker. Now we also have to look at post-treatment. Uh, how is healthy lifestyle gonna help us with that? Uh, the main one is, it's going to help reduce our risk of cancer. It's going to help us reduce the risk of secondary cancers as well, which is important. So I'm going to focus on breast cancer here. So I've talked about a breast cancer prevention plan. Again, our buddies are here, fruits and vegetables. They have the vitamins, the antioxidants, I've listed them out the minerals, all of this, including fiber, are protective for breast cancer. This is from uh, peer review articles. So this is from a study also. It showed breast cancer patients who ate at least five servings per day, that's the old recommendation, which is really equivalent to two to two and a half cups of fruits and vegetables. 
and they also did physical activity, reduced the occurrence of uh, breast cancer rate by 50%. And how, is, how could this be happening? Well, antioxidant protects breast tissue by suppressing oxidative damage. So all of these things work together to prevent breast cancer. Now, where are you gonna find these vitamins, these antioxidants and minerals? We'll take the, the first couple. So vitamin A, I know I've put liver in here. If you can't do liver, it's still sweet potato, carrots, milk, eggs. So I've given examples of where you can find all of these vitamins, okay? And then also where you can find the minerals as well and where you can find the antioxidants. So carotenoids, that is a super good antioxidant. Okay, uh, so now we also wanna find foods that are high in antioxidants. So of course our buddies are still here, the fruits, the vegetables, the nuts, all of them high in antioxidants. And there was another article that I found that talked about spices um, having antioxidants in them as well. So here's a picture of what will be considered good. So do a photographic um, memory picture and then you can keep this for yourself. Okay. Another item that is good for breast cancer prevention, fiber. So again, another study found that premenopausal women who ate, who, who ate lot, um, the recommended amount of fiber from whole grains and fruit was 60% less likely to get breast cancer. So if you increase your fiber, decrease your saturated fat intake, you're gonna cut your reoccurrence by 24%. And how is that? How could that be happening? They're thinking that if you reduce your production of estrogen, that will also reduce your risk of breast cancer because estrogen is linked to uh, breast cancer rates. The fiber is gonna help reduce the absorption of some of these toxic chemicals and also the absorption of estrogen. And that's how that can prevent breast cancer. Okay, let's talk about saturated fats. So studies found that women who ate high amounts of saturated fats, remember saturated fats are not our friend. They're the bad fats you have a 20% more likely to develop breast cancer. And then women who ate more monounsaturated fats, these are the good guys, these are our friends. So that will be olive oil, and I really should take out canola oil there because that's not good anymore. But olive oil, sunflower oil, these are seed oils, they are our friends. They protect against breast cancer. And how could this be happening? Well, from this study, they showed that the saturated fats increase ovarian hormones. And when we have high levels of ovarian hormones, they can be exposed to breast tissue and stimulate that to turn into tissue that divides real quickly and that could then end up being breast cancer. So I know people might be salivating when they look at this, but no, no, no. These are the foods we cannot eat anymore. <laughs> Maybe when we were teens and we had hormones raging all over the place, we could burn it off, but not anymore. Okay, so additional support. Here's another study. Women on um, women who were on 
fat diets or on diets that reduced fat, they had uh, less dense breasts, which reduced their risk for breast cancer. I hope that made sense. Okay, second one. Women are 100 times more likely to get breast cancer compared to men. This one we know because of our hormones, estrogen. And then the study, the study showed women who had low ovarian hormone levels had fewer breast cancer rates. So breast cancer rates compared to the US are lower in Asia. So populations with less saturated fat in the diet and with less ovarian hormones had lower breast cancer rates. So that's really interesting, all of that, putting all of that together and kind of seeing how this can affect uh, someone's rate of breast cancer. Okay, now we'll talk about um, support for physical activity after treatment. We've talked about it bef before treatment, during treatment, now after treatment. So you have to sustain it. You can't just stop it all of the sudden and go, okay, I'm done. No, we have to keep it up. So moderate activity after breast cancer diagnosis improves survival. 30 to 60 minutes a day of moderate activity can result in 20 to 30% reduced risk of breast cancer. Regular physical activity decreases circulating sex hormones by 25 to 50%. So imagine if those are reduced that much, that's going to reduce your risk of breast cancer. Yeah, and, what, and that's what I've got at the bottom there. So possible protective mechanisms. So we'll look at insulin to start off with. High levels of, insi of insulin results in normal breast cancer cells to divide and also stimulates breast cancer growth and um, increases growth factor of breast cancer promoter. Physical activity lowers insulin and that's gonna lower your risk of breast cancer. That's gonna be the same with the sex hormones as well. High body fat is, is linked to high circulating estradiol, estrone and progesterone, which all increase your risk of breast cancer. Well, physical activity lowers body fat. So that's gonna lower your risk of uh, breast cancer and it lowers the circulating uh, hormones as well. So how does uh, physical activity also impact the immune system? Physical activity improves the immune system. Uh, it increases the number of fighting cells, which are your natural killer cells, your lymphocyte, and your um, activated killer cells and neutrophils, increases those. That's what you want, because that's going to kill the cancer cells. It also impacts uh, breast density. So you have changes in certain hormones and that's gonna decrease the dense, the dense breast tissue. And it also decreases the inflammatory markers, especially the C-reactive protein and your interleukin-6. And that's gonna decrease, um, get your immune system not to be fighting all the time. Okay, and then um, uh, protective activities. So these are things that you can do at home instead of just going to the gym or paying to go to the gym when they're going, but 
you can, there are things that you can still do at home. I know this sounds horrible, housework as a form of exercise, but study found that premenopausal women uh, that did housework for 18 hours reduced their risk of breast cancer by 30%. Postmenopausal women reduce breast cancer risk by 20%. Oh, sorry, the first one was premenopausal. This one is postmenopausal. Brisk walking reduced your breast cancer risk. Cycling, swimming, jogging, all of them are protective. So, consistent aerobic exercise, you want more than five hours per week, that is protection. Okay, so what I've put here is just some uh, uh, strategies on how to keep you going with your exercising, kind of having your warm up so you avoid injury and soreness. And then I've listed what the benefits of that would be. Uh, then I also talked about uh, the aerobic session as well to make sure you're doing it at the right intensity and for the right amount of time so you can gain the benefit of it as well. And then also cool downs. These are gonna be important as well. You don't wanna injure yourself after you've gone through all your cancer uh, treatment. And I've also talked about what the benefits of that could be. So kind of putting everything together we talked about studies that show how applying healthy lifestyle strategies before cancer treatment, during and after are beneficial to the body. And I've listed what those are. And also to mention, these will apply for any chronic conditions, not just cancer, but if you have diabetes, if you have high cholesterol, if you have scleroderma, uh, all of these other conditions, the same thing applies. Okay, questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Nianzi. I am aware of the time, but I want to, we'll stick around for a little bit for those that do have questions. But for those of you that might need to go, I just wanted to let you know, I'm going to email you soon with some of the links that Dr. Nianzi has shared in her slides. I'm also going to email you her contact information as well as Crystal Morse's contact information, who's the physician liaison. The recording of this presentation will be up in just a few days. And I also wanted to announce that Dr. Nianzi is going to be gifting to all of us a copy of the cookbook that has been created recently among her and her colleagues at City of Hope. So Crystal's going to be picking some up from City of Hope tomorrow, delivering them next week. So I will email you all again if you want to come by and pick one up. Uh, we'd love to provide that to you as well. So I just want to mention that. Um, so we have well, maybe a couple questions. And then we do have a quick poll evaluation we'd love for you all to fill out for us. Um, but one quick question.